this video will take a brief look at the MDAT add-in which once installed is available through the add-ins menu. The add-in provides, let me just actually remove the home window just to keep things uncluttered. The add-in provides a tabbed report. Uh, the first tab shows a summary of any model windows open. Currently I don't have any model windows open. They would be created either by uh, going into fit model and creating a model with a standard least squares personality. Um, I'm just going to create one just by running a script. So here I have a model uh, that we can take a look at. The window, the MDAT window, can be refreshed to pick up any new models that have been created. If you are running for the first time and you just want to explore this, then there is the ability just to launch a demonstration model. Uh, which will look very similar to the model that I'm actually running. So the first thing uh, we see is that we may have multiple models uh, built for different responses, in which case we'd have a list of the different responses, and then we just have some summary statistics for the model. And those summary statistics come from the summary of fit within the fit model platform. So these values have just been extracted. So in many ways MDAT is just an aggregator, it just extracts information and consolidates stuff into the same place. And we're trying to reduce mouse clicks. So for example, uh, AIC and BIC are not available by default on the summary of fit. To get that information we'd have to come in and remember that we can come down to here and actually retrieve uh, AIC and BIC information. The model contains a number of terms, so we can just verify what terms are in the model, and we could ask which of these effects are most significant, and we could use a normal probability plot or half probability plot. If I wanted to do the same within Jump, I'd actually have to go to a separate platform, so I can go to the screen and platform, uh, put in my response and my effects and then I can see which effects are significant. So this shows me the concentration is significant. Uh, we show the same graph except that uh, to help declutter the graph we just put an abbreviation on it and then in the legend we say that A equals concentration. Residual analysis forms an important aspect of model diagnostics. So we provide different ways in which you can look at residuals. The first one, again, is a probability plot to, um, to generate this. Normally, uh, we do have some uh, plots that we can look at within fit model, but I normally end up going to save columns, and I might save my residuals, and then I would come to the distribution platform, and I'd look at my residuals. And from here, I could look at a normal quantile plot. So that's the same uh, plot being shown. The next plot, we can either go down through this drop-down list or just scroll through these sequentially by using the next and back buttons. So now I'm looking at my residuals versus um, the response variable, uh, which I would have got by um, coming into... These are actually studentized residuals, so I would have um, achieved this plot by coming back to save columns, save my uh, studentized residuals and doing something like coming to the graph builder and now saying that I want my studentized residuals on the y-axis and I want my response variable on the x-axis and that pretty much gives me the same um, graph uh, as we have on the left hand side in the MDAT add-in. I like to have a reference line so uh, if it's useful for residuals to see where the zero line is and see how the residuals are scattering about zero. Because they're studentized, um, this scale on the left hand side has been put on the scale from minus three to plus three. And the graph builder could be used to look at um, the relationship of residuals versus the different predictors as well as the run order. So run order is just looking at, uh, we'd actually I don't think I can do a run order in Graph Builder, but I could use the overlay plot um, to just look at my uh, residuals uh, with nothing on the x-axis, just to give me the, uh, the the run order there. I'll come back to Cook's distance and just keep focus on the scatter plots for now. So now I have residuals versus each of my predictors. So if I would come back to my Graph Builder, then what we're saying is each of these predictors we could put on to the x-axis. Uh, oops, um, 
at that right so we literally want to look at each of these in turn uh, looking for patterns and the other one I had in here was uh, as well as looking at the residuals versus each of the x variables was Cook's distance uh, Cook's distance is a way of uh, assessing whether or not uh, particular data points might have undue influence on the regression and so we could from the fit model come in and find the appropriate menu option it's probably we have to actually go to save columns and save cook's distance and that saves data values to the data tables and those data values can then be plotted beyond looking at residual analysis we can ask the question whether or not uh, if we performed a transformation to our response would we um, get an improvement to the model performance and we can look at a box cox transformation which is the traditional way of uh, asking that question which can be done in fit model so under fit model I can look at go to um, factor profile in the box cox y transformation which gives me a graph unfortunately this graph you uh, so it does all the analysis for you but you have to really understand how box cox transformation works it just gives you this lambda variable which is a continuous variable numerical um, scale whereas normally what we're really asking is well would I be better off with a, a, a log transformation and inverse transformation so um, what we do in MDAT is just convert that numerical scale into uh, labels which are easier to interpret so this is showing that um, there's not really any difference between either doing a log transformation versus no transformation but if I did an inverse transformation things would be a lot worse so the sum of squares uh, is getting larger so the model would be worse this method was really developed in the 1960s when we probably didn't have the computing power to actually necessarily investigate these models so we just uh, make an inference using this test but uh, why not just actually fit all of the models behind the scenes and actually generate the, the statistics so what I show on this graph we've actually fitted the models with the different transformations picked out the R squared and just plotting the R squared showing me in this example uh, equivalent result the log and or no transformation are the best ones inverse and square a lot worse but I can also see that with no transformation um, four of my terms are statistically significant uh, whereas if I did a log transformation I simplify the model only three are significant so uh, this last effect the the wash time here which is just uh, marginally significant on this model uh, becomes uh, the p-value goes uh, greater than 0 0.05 on the the log model if you want to see this so I can just click on the link and here's the model so you can see wash time is actually 0 0.07 so it's not statistically significant so um, this summary not only shows summary statistics but also tries to give you an indication of whether or not by doing a transformation you are simplifying the structure of the model itself okay so that's um, about all I uh, hope you enjoyed it bye for now